everyone in here. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm just gonna give everybody just a few more seconds. We have a couple people still logging in here, it looks like. I just realized it's Friday the 13th. Happy Friday the 13th to everybody. Oof. Hopefully it's not a full moon too, right? <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are continuing our quarterly brain health series. And today we have with us our cognitive consultant, Jennifer Brush, as well as Julia Johnson, both from Brush Development. And I'm going to turn it over to them in a moment and they'll be discussing the stages of Alzheimer's. So thank you both for joining us this morning and I will let you take it away from here. Thank you, Marla. Glad to see everybody again. It's, it's good to have another um, brain health webinar. It's been a little while since our last one. If anybody's on that hasn't met me yet, I'm Jennifer Brush, and I am um, the cognitive consultant for Kendall at Home. I've been working for, with Kendall at Home for many years now. I've kind of lost track, well over 10 years, probably more like 15 years. And I'm available to help all members and their family who are working with the, living with the challenges of cognitive impairment. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist by training um, and I consult with families and care communities all over the country um, in ways to help them to continue to stay engaged in life and live a, a very meaningful life. Also on my team is Julia Johnson, who is a speech language pathologist as well. She specializes also in working with um, people who are living with cognitive impairment and supporting their, mem uh, their family members um, so that people can lead a very engaging and very independent life. And last year we um, worked with, met with the support group and spoke with many of you who are, have been attending the brain health um, webinars and asked you what topics that you would like us to cover for this year. So this year we are covering topics that all of you requested. And one of the most popular topics that you requested is a look at the different stages of Alzheimer's disease, what to expect, um, as you, you or your loved one may experience these different stages, understanding that everyone goes through dementia and cognitive impairment in their very own way, um, but what's common um, among each stage, and then what you can do, most importantly, um, what you can do. So um, I'm happy to introduce Julia today. She's going to be presenting our um, webinar and you'll meet her throughout the year. You may um, need an evaluation or some assistance. Um, she'll be here as part of the team to support you as well. So thank you. And uh, Julia, I'll let you get started. Great. Good morning, everyone. And I am excited to be here. Um, it is a fabulously beautiful day here today. So you can see I'm, I'm wearing my duds of summer. So I'm very. it's very good to have some warm weather. Um, I am, like Jennifer said, I am a speech therapist by background, and I have been with Brush Development since earlier this year. Um, I have extensive experience with uh, working in long-term care as well as working with families individually to help them be able to do more and help understand what they can do better for their loved ones and for themselves. So today, like she said, we're going to talk about changing and demystifying some of the Alzheimer's stages. What does it mean? What does it look like? And then kind of what you can expect as a general, uh, general overview and have a look at what it looks like, what the changes will be as far as behaviors, maybe some things that you can start planning ahead of time for, as well as what can the person still do? One of the things that we very often find ourselves doing because it's very scary, um, it's, a, it's a difficult process to go through, is we see the things that they can know, the person can no longer do. And if that might be yourself, what you might not be able to do as well as you did before. But there are still things that are preserved and we want to make sure that everybody is able to see those things and kind of reframe what it is that they, 
they do at home or do in a care community. So we'll get started this morning. First of all, oops, let me just see here. Oh, I had trouble with this before. Somehow or another, I cannot advance my screen. Oh, there we go. Sorry, gotcha. All right, so let's initially start talking about the general information about kind of the overview of Alzheimer's. What does it look like when you start having some symptoms? What are some facts about it? And here are just a few facts. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia, about 60 to 80% of cases that we see. You know as well as I do that there are a variety of other dementias that people do have. And um, that can be like a Lewy body, it can be vascular, it can be a mix of different things. And so, but Alzheimer's is a large disease process. There's a lot of individuals that have it. 5.8 million Americans live with it. And by 2050, we're looking at that projected number to rise to about 14 million. So you are not alone. No one is alone with this. I think that this disease at this point has touched, if not everyone, almost everyone globally. So it is also not something that's just here and people are dealing with it here. So about one in 10 people age 65 or older has, has Alzheimer's or will develop it. And so the interesting piece and something that we don't always think about when we're in our 40s and 50s and even earlier maybe is that disease is already laying inside our systems and it might be starting to brew and develop about 20 to 25 years before we actually see any clinical sign, even if it's a subtle sign. So one of the things that's really heavy in the science right now is how to look at some prevention as well as how to stave off some of those things by lifestyle and diet and different things like that. So just know that even before an individual shows that we have, that there's something going on, that that's been laying in there already for about 20 to 25 years and just didn't know it. So let's do just a quick overview of some of the things that might make you go, hmm, something just doesn't seem right here. One, and we'll just go through five signs of Alzheimer's um, or something that might start to look like Alzheimer's where you may start to have some questions yourself, whether it's for yourself or for a loved one or a friend that you might say, you know, they're, they just seem a little bit different and I don't know why. So one of the, we'll just go over five initial symptoms here today. And one of the first ones and the ones that we, we know about most is memory loss. And it's especially for getting like recent information. So that short term memories, the long term memories are going to stay for quite a long time. But those long, those short term memories of recent information, recent events, details, those things are going to start to slip. The individual may start forgetting some important dates, asking the same questions over and over. They may rely some more on memory aids like a planner, or they may have um, be asking questions and needing help with things that they didn't normally need to have help with before. And that might be something, let's say somebody's really good with math and has always done extremely well with managing the finances. And somehow or another, just lately, they're, they're losing checks or they're not paying something on time. Those might be some subtle signs that something's going on with the memory piece. There's also issues that come up with writing and speaking. And I think we notice the speaking part more because we don't, if they're friends of ours, we don't necessarily see them write anything very often, but they may have trouble. You may see that they just can't follow conversation as well as they used to. It's like they, they get bits and pieces, but you can see in their eyes that there's just something that they're not, it's not clicking the way it used to. Or the individual may have some trouble with repeating themselves, they may stop in the middle of a conversation and huh, just kind of lose track and kind of fall off topic, not knowing where that conversation or that, that discussion was going. And they may have some word finding problems where something as simple as, you know, it's springtime right now, perhaps they're going out to do their gardening and they love gardening and they have every possible tool available, but they can't figure out Oh, that, you know, the thing with the teeth, uh, handle, yeah, whatever, you know, that thing. And so you may see some of that when you get into some of the earlier stages as well as some of the middle stages. And so they may struggle with some vocabulary or have problems 
figuring out the right word. It's right there on the tip of my tongue I, or a person's name. Uh, the third early sign that we'll go over is the confusion of time and place, that orientation. The temporal lobes, which are kind of on the sides of our brain, take care of a lot of that, that time uh, information. And those, those areas may start to change a little bit. We also see then that the person has difficulty with dates, especially early on. Um, sometimes in the later stages, you'll see that there's, there's the seasons well, they just aren't recognizing, you know, spring from fall and different, those nuances of different time passage. They have trouble understanding something that isn't happening right now. They can't, they can't really relate to something that happened just a little while ago or might be happening in the future. And they forget where they are or, or actually how they got there. And I know that even for myself, my mother-in-law is going through Alzheimer's currently my father-in-law also at the same time had some dementia uh, symptoms as well. And my mother-in-law would just, she just would lose track of where she was um, getting somewhere. When she was at the grocery store, she would just kind of stop and look around and just not recognize what she was doing and why she was there. So time and place confusion can be a, a sign. Um, and then challenges in planning or problem solving taking charge, especially for the individual who was always the go-getter, the one who made the decisions, they may have the inability now to do some of those things independently, develop a plan or follow, uh, again, working with numbers and with the finances and maintaining different, maintaining that checkbook, maintaining the money, doing the laundry, even making some higher level decisions, especially if that person is still in the workforce. And from a home perspective, it might be following a recipe. It might be, you know, keeping track of whatever happens monthly, not just bills, but appointments and haircuts. And that was one of the things that my mother-in-law just completely lost track of was she was unable to schedule my father-in-law's hair appointment to get his haircut. And that was a big thing for her. And suddenly she, she stopped writing things on the calendar and she wasn't able to take care of their checkbook anymore as well. They have some difficulty concentrating where it's, they'll start something, but they might get distracted or they just, they just can't put the pieces together in order to maintain attention to something. And it takes them a lot longer to do things because of that change in attention and concentration. But it's also just because maybe they get up and they go and do something else and they come back. They, they just can't get those jobs done. And then the next one here, um, I believe this is the fifth one we'll talk about today, is difficult, excuse me, difficulty completing a familiar task. Um, it might be cooking if it's a homemaker. It might be a routine task that the person does at work. It might be doing the laundry. It might be changing the oil in the car. It, it might be driving to a certain place that they've always gone to, the same grocery store, the, a family member's house. And that was one of the big signs for my mother-in-law when she was having issues was she, would, she got halfway to my sister-in-law's house and she couldn't remember where she was going. And then she couldn't, she finally got there. She had to be talked through it a little bit, but then she had issues realizing where she was and how to get back home. So driving can be a really, can be a big challenge as well. Um, difficulty managing a budget at work uh, and doing other work, work jobs as well, um, work responsibilities. And then remembering the rules of a game, playing with the grandkids, a game that they used to be able to play without any issues. And now grandma needs some more, she needs cues. So the kids are helping her along. So let's talk about now that we have kind of a, a basic overview of what it is that some of the symptoms might be. What is dementia? And Alzheimer's is dementia, but Alzheimer's is a disease itself. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's a term that covers a whole bunch of symptoms. It's a big umbrella. And all of these symptoms are underneath that umbrella. And it's largely associated with memory loss and other changes to those problem solving, those thinking skills, initiation, um, identifying time and place. And, and you will also notice that there can be a change, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, related to visual spatial function. So recognizing where you are in space and how far things are away, where things are coming from as far as sound and different things like that. 
And so many diseases have the symptoms of dementia. And Alzheimer's clearly is one of them. So here are just a few types of dementia. Um, the more uh, familiar ones for most people are Lewy body, Alzheimer's clearly, um, frontotemporal dementia. Um, there is a very, there's a, a cognitive change that goes along with Parkinson's as well as Huntington's. Um, vascular dementia is, is something that we hear about quite a bit related to um, uh, and exercise changes in the blood vessels and things like that within the brain. Uh, mixed dementias, which are an, a couple of different dementias put together. And then the last four there are just some more um, types of dementia, not necessarily as well known as some of those other ones. So it comes then to, hmm, you know, Sue next door, she's just acting a little strange. Or, you know what, mom is just not herself. She's, have you noticed she's been forgetting things? And dad has to help her with a lot of different things. Or, hey, dad's not able to, you know, figure out how to even mow the lawn very well anymore. He needs a lot of help from mom to, to get going and to get up and do stuff in the morning. And so those questions come from family members. They come from friends. And it's then time to say, hmm, maybe we should have this looked at. And the big thing for this is it's very interesting. Everybody is so individual in when they're willing to do this, the family may say, mom, dad, whomever it is, we've got to get you in. Let's go. There's some things going on here. And the sooner we know, the better. But that's the person who's living in it. And if that's you, it's pretty scary. And the, the thinking of the changes that may go on in, in what your life is going to look like, people don't necessarily want to know that answer. But what I will say is that currently there is so much scientific literature there are so many things being discussed and researched right now about how to try to prevent and stabilize the disease for longer periods of time. So there's, there's these different hopeful glimmers right now. But what we do know is that the sooner people find out, very often the better. You can plan, you can understand what's going to happen better, you can educate family, you can educate friends, and you can kind of look at what some changes are going to be and how you're going to manage those in the future. So initially, the diagnosis, one of the questions is who? How, who do you go to? And it generally starts with your PCP or your primary care physician. And you go in and you discuss the changes that you're noticing. And that primary care physician or your, your primary doc is going to say, you know what, I think you're right. We need to check this out further. And then nextly, they'll, they'll refer you on to neuropsych or um, a neurologist. And so they'll just make that referral. And then when and how that happens is the referral. But then when you get there, what's going to happen? Well, you may have some brain imaging done um, where they go in and they might do an MRI. They may start with a CT, but MRI is generally the, the practice. Um, looking at different volumetric changes within the brain, and that's what they're going to look at related to the MRI. And if you have the opportunity to, to get a PET scan, sometimes those are available as well. Um, but then they'll also have you do some testing and figure out, have your loved one do some testing and figure out what it is, which domains. And when I talk about domains, it's is it language? Is it attention? Is it those thinking functions, those, dy those dynamic decision-making, planning kind of se sections of the brain, are those affected? And neuropsych testing will let you know those things. And then based on those results, a diagnosis will come. So ultimately, it's really dependent on when the individual is, is ready to have that done. And I'll go back to my mother-in-law here. She was hopelessly resistive and resisted and resisted. And it wasn't until three or four years after she um, started developing signs and symptoms that she was finally willing to go in. So somebody might be really early on willing to go and some people may fight it until it, the, they just can't fight it anymore. So let's talk about the stages here. Um, and we'll go through, there's three primary stages, but I've, I've added two additional ones here. The subjective cognitive impairment, SCI, you may hear of it called, or you may hear it called SCD, which is subjective cognitive decline. That's not necessarily a stage, but it's a representation of a period of time where someone, oops, let me forward this, um, let me define it for you. 
um, it's a self-reported time when somebody is noticing that something I'm feeling really off. I have some brain fog. There's, I'm just, I'm not as efficient with what I used to do. And so they may have some, they maybe have some forgetfulness, um, just some unusual confusion. They might not be as efficient in what they're doing in tasks at work or tasks at home. And it's a very early, early sign. Nobody will recognize it except the person. But it is not a definitive diagnosis of dementia or uh, um, dementia or Alzheimer's because the person may just have brain fog from something else. Um, and this may not progress into Alzheimer's, but it can be you know, a first subtle step, a first subtle note, uh, note that the individual is starting to see something unusual. And so what does it look like? Subjective cognitive impairment, you just have, like I said, that kind of forgetfulness. There might be a train of thought that gets lost here and there. Maybe the feeling of overwhelm, especially at work. If you are somebody who has a, a high paced job or you're an individual who's older, who just really is on the go, taking grandkids here and there, you've got these groups that you go to, you go to the gym and suddenly those things just seem to be a little bit too much. And the planning of it just isn't going the way it used to go. And, but you just think it's, you know, you, you're just noticing this, but nobody else really is. So who does it affect? At this level, um, SCI really only affects the individual that's experiencing it. Um, family, uh, care partners, neighbors, whomever, they're not gonna notice any differences at this time. There's no need for anybody to give assistance. It's just subjective that the person is recognizing some change. So that's the first subtle change. Then there's a mild cognitive impairment. And this is a little bit, um, a little bit more observable by others. And so let's talk about the definition here. So mild cognitive impairment causes cognitive changes that are serious enough to be noted by the person affected and then the family members, but not necessarily changing the way the person can perform a daily task, or you're not losing things and putting them in very unusual places. But again, there's that inefficiency. There's, there's just a change in maybe some questioning or the need to have a little more help with something. So others are starting to recognize it at this point, but it's not really disrupting the person's life. And in this case as well, MCI can, can be part of Alzheimer's or it can be showing up as some sort of other type of dementia. Um, and it can also be still related to something like hormonal levels or medication. Um, and so when you see or recognize these things, having a, having a closer look and a good investigation is gonna be very helpful and definitely talking to your PCP. So what does it look like? Again, losing things more often, forgetting to go to events or appointments. You know, there was a band concert for the kids the other night and Marion forgot. She never forgets. Or, you know, that my mother-in-law in, -law in, the, in the, uh, the barber appointment for my father-in-law, she would remind him. Suddenly she didn't remind him anymore. Um, having trouble coming up with words uh, that's a little bit different than people the same age. And this is gonna be obviously more noticeable if the individual is younger um, in their 40s or 50s. And then there might be some changes related to movement. And what I'm talking about that is that sometimes walking the steps or stepping off of a curb, um, maybe even just walking, the, the step length is a little bit different or the cadence, the swinging of the arms, it just doesn't look like it used to. So those types of things are gonna be just some of the subtle changes that you're going to notice at the mild cognitive impairment stage. So at this point, who is it affecting? Clearly, it's affecting the individual who's experiencing it. And that person is obviously going to be affected by all of these things throughout the entire process. But at the same time, sometimes the person is noticing it, doesn't want it to be noticed by other people. And so you may have some, there may be some masking tendencies going on, indicating that the person maybe uses some humor or tries to explain something away. Because again, nobody wants to see this. Nobody wants to feel this and experience it. Um, from a caregiver or a care partner perspective and from family, 
they're going to make those notice that they're going to be noticing some of those changes. They may start to make some comments about, you know, mom, I'm really wondering if something's going on or dad, I think, have you noticed that mom is having some changes with, um, you know, setting up your hair appointment um, or walking out in the yard? And this, again, going back to my mother-in-law as the example, she started having trouble making the steps. And she had recently just had a knee replacement. And so we kind of thought that that might be part of the problem, but it, clearly it ended up that as she rehabbed and did well, her stairs continued to be just different in her walking. So um, at this point, family members and, and people who love this individual or the person themselves are going to say, hey, you know what, I think maybe we should check this out a little bit more. That brings us to the early stage. So at this point, more than likely, there has been some sort of testing. Um, mom and mom or dad or uncle, aunt, you know, neighbor may have gone in and have had some had some check uh, of these different things. May have had some uh, volumetric brain scans. May have had some um, neuro testing. And so what we come to with this is this is the largely what we'll call the first stage where it is truly diagnosed here. Um, and it's the early stages, it's characterized by similar changes to those that we see in mild cognitive impairment, but now we're gonna start to see and we're, that progression is going to be um, identified more and more over the years to come. So how does it look? Early stage Alzheimer's, it's very similar to uh, mild cognitive impairment but there may be some additional, it's not as subtle anymore. It's going to be more noticeable. There's gonna be trouble understanding visual images and spatial, spatial relations. And one of the things that's interesting, it goes back to movement patterns within the body, but it's also related to what people understand from a picture perspective. They may not understand what they're seeing when they look at a picture, because it's flat, it's not three-dimensional. And people may also have trouble parking their car or backing up. Um, they, they just don't have those perceptions, that, that depth and understanding the spatial piece that goes along with it. Um, misplacing things. And this is, again, where you're going to really start having people who, who have the item that's left in the refrigerator or a telephone that's left under the bed. And not because it was kicked there by accident, but for some reason went under the bed, left the phone, and so those unusual things are going to be starting to appear. Decreased um, thinking and poor judgment. So they may not be making as good of decisions as they did before. Um, withdrawing from work or social activities. And this is because the stimulation of the event is just too much to handle. And again, remember this uh, early stages on a continuum from a person who is just kind of in that mild cognitive impairment level with being tested and now knows they have Alzheimer's to moving into that later middle stage of Alzheimer's. So there's gonna be a, a variety of, of differences among individuals as well. But from, from the progression standpoint, um, they may initially withdraw from a social activity at work because there's just too many people or even later on when there's very few people, they still become withdrawn. So you're gonna see some of those types of things. And then changes in mood and personality. And a lot of those mood changes are related to fear, um, the realization, they're going through grief, grief and they're recognizing that there's some really scary things to come and they're wondering how they're going to manage it as well as how they're going to plan. And then personality, some of that is because of frustration. They, they get more irritable because they just can't do the things that they used to be able to do and they know it. It's frustrating, it's saddening, it's maddening to the individual. And as caregivers and care partners, one of the things that at these stages and throughout the entire progression of Alzheimer's is making sure that we take time. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So who does it affect? Again, clearly that person who is going through um, this, this early stage of dementia or early stage of Alzheimer's, you're gonna, they're gonna notice their own abilities changing and it's very frightening and, it's, and you're gonna grieve the losses. And so 
they're still going to be able to act independently and be able to do things there in their environment, but they may need more, need more cueing as time goes on and more assistance. For the family and the care partners at this level, they're going to be probably helping some, giving some cues. Um, you're gonna be noticing the changes with more consistency. Um, and at the same time, the cues that we, we as people who are loving members of a family or who are the, the doting neighbor or somebody who just really cares about the individual or, or you is that they, we will try and help, but we also just have to recognize that sometimes they, they still want to be able to do it by themselves because they still can. This is the time to start discovering the can-dos, the reframing, the throw away the whole they can't or they won't be able to. And let's start to look at what is still there, what they still have in their hands, what they still have in their heads and in their heart. And one of the easiest things to do early on is to create a command station. That post in the house that has the keys or whatever important items are needed for that person to get through um, a specific portion of the day, there might be different ones in different areas of the house, depending, maybe there's one by the rocking chair, um, one in the bathroom that has to do with medications, different things like that. But again, maintaining as much independence for individuals is so critical. It's so critical for the success of the person from a confidence perspective, from a dignity perspective, as well as the family saying, yes, we can still, mom can still do this because we're helping her and giving her some options that we just, we never thought of before. We didn't have to. So using calendars, if people don't use calendars or the phone, if they can still use their phones. Um, technology, there is so much technology now with um, uh, Alexa or Google Assistant stuff that something can be just programmed and it can say, hey, Millie, you got to take your noon pills. And if they're all set out and ready, she goes over, takes them, um, and so there's, we can use technology in a myriad of ways to help an individual at this point as well. Um, putting keys and other items in the same place, reducing the opportunity for overwhelm. And overwhelm is a problem no matter if you have Alzheimer's and dementia or if you don't. So what overwhelm does is it takes everything we're concerned about and it literally stops us from doing things. And so when you're overwhelmed, you don't know what to do. So you end up not getting anything done. And I know that from a work perspective, even for myself, but when, again, you're moving through these phases where you're watching mom or dad or your neighbor or yourself move through these phases, overwhelm and anxiety is a, it, it's a realism. And there's medical, obviously pharmacolog pharmacological ways that we can handle that. But if there's ways that we can manage that anxiety and that overwhelm in the, in the home by decreasing the number of events you go to, or actually talking to the person and saying, you know, what is it that is really, what can we do to help this? How can we lay out this day better for you? How can we get you ready for tomorrow, tonight, before you go to bed? And then providing encouragement to the person um, and helping them to identify things that they can still do. Let's say they were a painter, but they're not able to paint those gigantic, beautiful pictures anymore, but they still want to paint. Okay, let's, let's get a station set up in the house or wherever they're living and see if we can't bring some of those things to life. And here's one more thing too in related to um, the can-dos is actions to help with recall, labeling cabinets. If it becomes a, a period now, reading is one of the very, or it's very preserved as far as an ability. So making sure that cabinets are labeled um, planning and caring for the finances. And this is one thing I'll talk about in just a minute is kind of getting things ready, having discussions and talking about what the plan is going to be moving forward. So when those things happen and the person can't do their usual routines and usual um, responsibilities in the home anymore or at work, what, what happens? And that also goes along with real estate planning. So the other thing here is that there's going to be some changes in communication. And talking is 
what we mainly think of when we think of communication, but we need to have a look at both our communication to the person as well as that person's communication to us. And so we know that they're gonna have word finding problems or, but we also as a listener need to be respectful and to observe and slow our rate and change the words we use maybe a little bit in order to meet the needs of the person we're talking to. So taking time during conversation. If it's the other person's turn to talk, the individual who's been diagnosed, let them, let them take their time, give them time. If you're gonna go visit and you're gonna have a, have, spend some time with this individual, just enjoy it and be relaxed. One, it's gonna help the individual feel much better. And it's also going to allow for more back and forth from a communication perspective. The, the next thing is, of course, our nonverbals. Nonverbals are huge. Regardless if you're young or old, we all recognize by somebody's posture, by their facial expression, rolling the eyes, the sighing, how they stand, how somebody feels. And so making sure that you're that you are with the person when you're communicating and not demonstrating some of those, oh, you know what, she's just taking too darn long. You know, um, making sure that you look at your own um, nonverbals so that the person that you're with recognizes you want to be there. The one, the next thing here is just a tidbit, but it is something that's important is sharing the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And in these early stages, when the individual still has the capability to share it, it is one of the things that is a very individual and personal decision as to do we tell someone, do we tell our kids, who do we tell, how do we tell them? And that is very personal. It's very family-based. So, but what it is, what's interesting is, is that there's going to be periods of time or things to consider whether you're still in the workforce and how that's going to affect the working relationship you have. Can you tell them? When can you tell them? Because you also don't want to have another issue where you get fired from something because, of, because you never shared information, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot of moving parts with that. Um, and talking with children. Children may wanna know earlier in case there's a genomic factor. Do they wanna have a look and see if they can you know, preserve something? Is there something that they can plan for as well? So it really is based on what the family and the individual who's been diagnosed and maybe their spouse or that very close person to them um, when you decide. But I will say that in, in many cases, the earlier you decide to talk about it, at least with family, the, the more planning and the more understanding um, can, can actually go on. And this is true for friends as well. So what you'll see then is there's life through a new lens. It's time to take off the old glasses of what used to be normal because normal is gonna be different and normal is going to change. And so we wanna look through a new lens, but the big thing to always remember is that if it's a, a loved one of yours, that the person is still your loved one. You still love them just as much, regardless. It might be more frustrating, things are gonna change, but you still love them. And so this level of dementia, the early stage can last for several years. And so it might be very slow to progress and then progress quickly. It might be quickly to progress all the way through. It's very hard to say because it's very individual as well. But we wanna make sure that from a care partner perspective, that we recognize that the person who's been diagnosed is going to feel different. The spouse is going to feel different. The children are going to feel different. And if it's in the workforce, there's a secret now. So again, going and if that creates anxiety, it may be time to talk to somebody about it. But all of these things play into these early stages of planning and preparation. Um, there's certainly going to be fear of loss. Many people go through parts of that um, grief um, scenario. And then there's going to be the, the time for the individual who's been diagnosed to say, no, I don't want any help. I wanna be able to do this by myself. And times when it's, I really need help with this, but it's not gonna be said like that, 
the care partners are going to have to sometimes read that or provide some additional support for those things. Behaviors, will there be any at the early stages? Not a lot of them. Um, there's gonna be more frustration and that depression and grief, um, maybe some withdrawal um, from, from situations that are really busy, have high stimulation, let's say it's Christmas or it's um, a big gathering of sorts for family, um, family reunions. It might be very difficult to do those or spend a long period of time like you used to be able to spend at those kind of events. Um, and there may be some um, desire to experience more additional, or there may be some more additional changes that occur. But at the beginning, it's generally more frustration and irritation. So let's talk about the middle stage now. What is the definition of that? During the middle stage is where those symptoms become more pronounced. There needs to be a lot more help going on with that individual who has, is experiencing the dementia. Um, there's going to be more frustration. There's going to be words that don't come out. There's going to be um, situations where somebody may not understand the need to get dressed. And now there's a lot more damage going on in the brain. There may be some volume changes. Um, and so the things that are outside of normal routine tasks become very difficult, or the individual may need help with them now um, through the progression of this stage. So what does this look like? Again, it's going to compound on what you saw before in the, M, in the early stages, the MCI, as well as the early stage. But now it's going to be unable to recall information about themselves, not necessarily knowing, did they go to high school? Did they go to college? This is sometimes where, where faces may become unfamiliar. Um, requiring more help to choose the proper clothing based on the seasons. It might be that they're not, maybe they're more resistant to changing clothes. I know for my mother-in-law, for sure, it was one of those situations where she wore turtlenecks all year long because she understood the shirt. And as my sister-in-law didn't understand that at the time, so we explained the reason for it, it becomes so much more so there just becomes a better understanding for other family members when there's some rationale as to why the individual is doing this. Why won't mom take her blasted turtleneck off? Well, because she doesn't understand that she needs to, and she may just have thought that she did. So having troubles controlling the bladder and the bowels, we're going to see that this at, that, at this stage, and you're going to probably need some undergarments of sorts. Um, they may have some tendency to wander, so you're going to be watching to make sure that they don't leave unexpectedly. They may not be able to get back to, to the house or to wherever from where, they're, where they've gone to. And then there may be some behavioral changes in this area, looking at some hallucinations, um, some compulsive behavior that do the same thing over and over and over and over. Um, one, it might be very comfortable, but secondly, they don't know sometimes that they did it just a moment ago. And then there's that repetitive behavior. Who does this affect? Now everybody's affected for sure. Um, the individual is going to need a lot more assistance with daily activities. Um, a large, and again, we are on a continuum here. So at the beginning of the middle phase, the individual may still be able to do some things, but may need some heavier assistance. And then toward the end, it's the end of the middle phase here, it's going to be largely all attention um, for all those tasks. It's gonna be provided by somebody else. Um, they may not be able to articulate how they feel anymore. It may become the caregiver or the care partner's responsibility to recognize facial changes, behaviors, different things that the person does because they can no longer tell you how they feel or what they need. Um, from a care partner and a family perspective, this might be a time to consider some respite if you need it or having swapping out family to come in and support or to have neighbors come in and help support. I think the big thing at this phase that is very difficult for many, many caregivers, and I know it was for my father-in-law in particular, he never wanted help from anyone. I can take it, I can handle it, but it ended up burning him out. So from a caregiver perspective, please allow yourself the, and give yourself permission to have help and support from other people. 
um, discovering the can do's, an absolute need here. So that person is going to have preserved skills. They're going to be able to, they may not be able to imagine the way they used to. So your imagination may be needed to come in to find out what the person can still do. You're going to have to watch. And observation is very, very, very hard. But if you watch and observe what your loved one or your neighbor is doing, you may be able to pick up some beautiful facts about the things that they still can do. They may love to just listen to music and sway or to do a little bit of dancing with it. Perhaps they were big into poetry and because they can still read, you can sit and read with them. Um, they may be able to um, do some of the basic hobbies that they used to do. They might be able to do some matching and color sorting and, but let's look at it from a functional perspective and is there something they can still do in the home environment where they are? I recently saw a picture um, of a woman who, and the story behind it, she was, it was a photo of her from the back in her wheelchair and she had her arms stretched up to the sink and she was washing vegetables. And the story behind the photo was that the family didn't know what to do with her and she was sitting in the house and she was just rolling back and forth in her wheelchair. But the daughter said, do you want to help us cook today? And well, she was all excited about it. Well, she couldn't use a knife anymore or anything, but she helped clean all the vegetables and she got them all set out on the table so that whomever was cutting them up could do so. So she was still part of the process. And for anyone, and this we'll talk about in a second as well, anybody who has these preserved skills is still a person. So they still have these desires to be social and to be with other people and to do things that are purposeful. A few more things are the desire to be needed for advice. And again, that goes back to being human. They don't want to not be asked what they want to wear. They, they might not be able to answer in the same way, but they still want the opportunity to participate or participate in cooking or setting the table um, to have meaningful work. And in doing so, sometimes there's additional queuing strategies like placing a placemat on the table that has the silhouette of a fork, a spoon, a knife, a plate, and the individual is able to follow the pictures in order to set the table. And they're still participating. They're still enjoying that part of their lives. Time spent outside is a big one. Who doesn't like the sun on their face? And then following some um, directions and written directions can be very helpful at this stage. Again, they might not be able to comprehend it from a mental perspective, but they can still read it and with some help, they can make it through. Environmental supports are very helpful here. Um, I won't go through all of these, but I do wanna mention and highlight adequate lighting is extremely helpful. And I will say even for my middle life eyes at this point, extra lighting is really crucial for me. So when you get older, your visual, your vision changes, your eyes change. And so they require more light in order to be able to perform normal tasks. So make sure that lighting is appropriate where the individual is doing an activity or just where, whatever space they're in. Um, reduce, reducing glare from the windows. Um, big one is minimizing max, background noise um, and color contrasting. It's, it's the whole concept of eating a white pile of mashed potatoes on a white plate. And yes, white plates are beautiful and they're very classic, but they're not great when you're eating mashed potatoes and you don't have that visual perceptual ability anymore. So any kind of contrast um, is gonna be very helpful, whether that's in the food realm or if it's a sign to go into a bedroom, if you're labeling things at home, making sure that there's good contrast between what you want the person to see and what's in the background and not patterns. Um, placing items in the line of sight, providing written cues, and then wayfinding cues. This is a big one. And if the person is still living at home, it might be really helpful to have a big picture, very nice, in a great, easy place to see that indicates what that specific location is for. Maybe it's the washroom and there's a picture of a towel or there's something bathroom related, a bathtub on the photo. Um, or if there's something else that is just going to click with the person's mind to say, oh, I know I need to go this way because that picture is hanging there. So those things can be really helpful as well. And signs, if you want to put signs in your home as well, or on drawers and cabinets. 
life through a new lens. Here we are again. This is still your loved one. They still need love. You still love them. This is not going to change throughout this whole process. So that is the thing that everybody continues to need to remember. And even though it becomes difficult to communicate or frustrating to and sad to watch, they still need that love. They still need and have emotions. So we want to make sure that we provide that to them. Um, individuals, they may, they may still believe that they can perform tasks that are now unsafe, like driving, like cooking, or other things that have a lot of components to them. And so we want to make sure that if there is something that we can help them do, that they're provided with an opportunity to help, but not necessarily do them. Um, fear and anxiety are going to cause some quick changes now related to behaviors and um, feelings and mood. And the big thing too, that if you have somebody coming over to visit or a neighbor who is coming over and just really enjoys coming to visit, but doesn't know how to approach um, whomever this person is, teaching them and educating them on the best way to approach the individual, whether it's come and be sure that they come around to the front and come down to eye level, not coming from the back or the sides because the individual's back and sides might be shrinking. And as a person moves through this, pro this process, their environment starts to shrink until it's just pretty much right in front of them. And then what we consider curiosity under normal circumstances now can be um, kind of irritating to the, the observer when an individual goes in and starts hauling things out of um, drawers or you know, starts rummaging through different things, looking for something that nobody really knows what they're looking for. Um, but those things can be reframed as well to have somebody do something where they can rummage around and look for certain things. And it keeps them purposeful, it keeps them doing something, and it also keeps them from going through the drawers that you don't want them to go through. So looking at how you can, again, kind of reframe and flip the switch in order to make something that was irritating, something that's now a great thing. Um, what kind of behaviors here? Well, in the middle stage, we get anger and irritation. You may not know why, the person may not know why. And it might simply be because they're afraid. Something startled them and made them nervous and paranoid. Um, there's going to be some resistance to hygiene. There may be some hallucinations, um, emotional outbursts, and there's most likely going to be some sleep cycle changes where they're up in the night suddenly. My mother-in-law was one of these people where she slept from 10 o'clock at night until six in the morning, and then suddenly she was up in the middle of the night. And she didn't do anything. She just, she would go to the kitchen window and she would stand and see herself in the window and she would talk to the lady outside. And so it was my, my, when my husband went to stay with her in her, in, in that stage, because my father-in-law had been hospitalized. Um, she, he was like, yeah, she just got up and she would just talk. And then she went back to bed. So she, her need was satisfied and she went back to sleep. So it, it's very different for everyone. But these blue faces are on the, on the right side of the page, definitely all of the emotions that everybody will feel. Then finally, the, the late stage, and this is the last of the stages. Um, and this is the stage, again, along with those other stages can last months or years. Um, and although the person in this stage usually loses their ability to talk at some point during it, or um, maybe has some single words here and there, Research tells us that that individual still has the capability of feeling emotion. And so we always wanna make sure when we go to visit or that we sit with that person, that we provide that just a good positive environment and that we're not angry and we're not disgusted because they can feel that. And what you'll also know and may have heard already is that ultimately individuals can, they, they don't know you, but they remember how you made them feel. So that's a big, big thing to always keep in the back of your mind when you go to visit somebody who you don't think is really paying attention or they are. Um, so the late stage here, what does it look like? There's gonna be the difficulty with eating and swallowing here. They may no longer be able to walk or they may need some help with walking. Um, they may try and get up and move around on their own, um, which obviously is gonna be uh, fall risk. They may need some help with personal, they will need some help and will need full-time help with, with personal cares. 
And at this stage too, they become very vulnerable to infections, especially if they're not getting up and moving around. Some people in the late stages or in the early part of the late stage will still be able to get up and, and, and ambulate or be able to walk. Um, but as they move through and get toward the end and the end of life, they, they may have very limited movement in their, in whatever they're in, in a chair, in a bed. And so infections, keeping a person dry if the person is at home are going to be extremely important. So if there's any sores, things keep, things are kept safe and kept as uh, clean as possible and dry. And then there is clearly an issue with pneumonia um, related to the incoordination when a person is um, eating, eating foods or swallowing liquids. So who does it affect? Obviously, it affects everyone. At this, at this period, the individual themselves are going to need to be helped with everything. Um, they may actually eat sometimes and sometimes not. They may take liquid sometimes, sometimes not. Now, clearly, we want to always make sure that they are getting the maximum amount of what they need in order to remain as healthy as possible. Um, but sometimes you can only do so much. And what you try to do is just excuse me, go back and try it again later. Um, they tend to be very sedentary now. For the most part, they don't go anywhere. And if there is any possibility at this point where the individual still has free flowing limbs, try and keep those limbs moving as much as possible um, so that they don't get contracted and pulled in. And then from a caregiver perspective, again, it depends so much on the family um, and what kind of support they can give if the person stays remaining at home or if they go into a long-term care community. And so we still, no matter what, want to preserve that person's dignity, want them to be as healthy as possible and want to still remember that they have their essence, they're still there. They don't look the same, they don't act the same, but they do have feelings in there. So at this point, again, it's, it's a determination of the family whether they actually stay at home or they go somewhere else, or um, you hire somebody to come in and take care of them. The can-dos, remember, still preserved. They're still in there. And it's very different than when it was earlier when they were trying to help you with something or getting into something. Now it might be just playing favorite music. It might be reading a portion of a book. Um, it might be looking at a memory book if they're in the early phases of the late stage or and you created this memory book earlier on. Um, memory books are so fabulous because they have pictures of what the individual knew. They might have a written caption at the bottom so that anybody can read through the book with them. And at the beginning, the book may be all about a whole variety of things that, kept, that were memories for the person. But as the person moves through the stages, the memory book can change as well, taking pages out, adding pages in, making the, the photos different. Um, and so going through and reminiscing a little bit about that with just talking and providing a calm and enjoyable voice can really help that individual. Rubbing lotion on their hands, um, brushing or combing their hair. If you can get them outside, again, letting that sunshine hit their face. And then sometimes singing. And the interesting thing on this is my husband, my, we had to put his mother in a long-term care facility and he went to visit her a couple weeks ago and she's in the very late stages now. And she didn't demonstrate any recognition that there was almost anybody in the room. She doesn't have much for eye gaze anymore. She just sat and he talked to her and he rubbed her hand and he, she was very calm and she, she very much, you could tell like her body and she enjoyed the visit. And he got up to leave about 45 minutes later and he walked away and he said, bye mom. And she looked over at him and she said, love you, honey. And then she disappeared. And so him being far enough away for her to recognize that he was either coming or going or whatever it was in her system that recognized that she had that little, that little moment of brilliance, and then she left, but it was very satisfying for both of them. So at this stage, remember, they're still your loved one, you still love them, and somewhere in there, they love you, 
They have the need to be loved. And there are going to be intermittent periods of intention, just like I talked about with my husband. Um, but they may not make eye contact. They may not really recognize sound a whole lot anymore um, or reach out. But sometimes they will. Sometimes they'll turn their head if they hear somebody that they recognize, especially if it's a really special someone. Um, but they are going to remember if they like you or if, they made, if you made them feel good. So keep that in mind as well. And behaviors, here we go again with all those faces. Everybody's going to feel all kinds of these faces, but um, they're going to be agitated. They may just vocalize for reasons you don't know. It might be because they hear something that they really enjoy and they're just, they're vocalizing. It might be something related to pain. There's going to be a variety of different sounds that they make, movements that they make that not everybody's going to understand, but from that observe, observance perspective, watching is going to help cue you in to some of these things. And at this point, they're also going to be sleeping more than they're awake until they're asleep all the time. So in conclusion, the topics we talked about today was basically an overview of Alzheimer's, what the symptoms, some early symptoms are, some of the five basic ones that we see. We talked about the subjective, the um, mild cognitive impairment levels, early, middle, and late stage, and some of the behaviors, some of the things that they still have preserved, and the fact that they still continue to be a person with an essence and with a heart, and we need to love them all the time. Um, but remember, uh, throughout the progression of Alzheimer's, your loved ones will show signs of what is still enjoyable take the time to recognize those things, watch and listen, and watch the magic that comes out of all the things that are available to you. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you so much, Julia. Um, if you have a question for Julia, you can click on chat and type in the question and we'll be happy, she'll be happy to address the questions you might have. But what a great comprehensive oversight, just a look into dementia and just so, so many great tips and um, warning signs and things to look for and uh, just very helpful information provided as a whole. Thank great. you. Take a moment to give people a chance to type in any questions they might have. Again, you can just click on the chat at the bottom of your screen and type in the questions and we'll address them for you. And of course, if there aren't any now, um, we are happy to take questions later as well. I know sometimes taking, putting all of this together is, is a lot of information. Absolutely. Um, one of the members is asking if they can have a copy of the presentation. Um, the presentation from Julia has been recorded as well. So it will be on our website for our members to view in the member portal. Um, as far as a hard copy of the presentation, I don't know if, are we sending those out? Uh, no, okay. So they, the video will be in um, probably by the end of next week in the member portal for you, your ability to view anytime you would like. Just a reminder for everyone as well that we have a dementia support group for caregivers living and caring for individuals with dementia. They meet once a month. Um, if you are not already a part of that group and are interested, please reach out to your care coordinator and they will share that information with you as well. Okay, Jennifer or Julia, anything else you'd like to add at all? No, I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> all right, well, thank you both so much for the information and we appreciate you joining us today and have a great weekend. Thank you. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.